Good evening to most, if not all of you. I'm so grateful that you found time to uh, take time off from what I know is a very hectic schedule to be with us here tonight for what I know will be a very... What you're about to see is a show which was produced to raise money for the Terence Higgins Trust a little while ago on the stage here in the heart of the West End's famous London. It was called, for reasons that will never become readily apparent, Hysteria 2. It contains performances from, amongst others, Harry Enfield, Dawn French, Jennifer Saunders, Lenny Henry, Rowan Atkinson, John Cleese, Hugh Laurie, Tina Turner, Robbie Coltrane, Jeremy Hardy, and the list is quite literally right in front of me. But before we unwind this soft, strong, and surprisingly long roll of comedy, I ought to say one Leo Tooley things about AIDS. You know, there's been a lot of unhelpful publicity recently. The fact is, that over 3,000 people in this country are known to be infected with the HIV virus through heterosexual sex. The recent publicity has also caused confusion about AIDS. If you feel you want to know more, call 0800 567 123, which will connect you to the National AIDS Helpline, which is staffed by trained AIDS counsellors. During the show, you'll be seeing some short films which highlight the vital work being done by AIDS charities like the Terence Higgins Trust, Britain's first AIDS charity. And a new body, too, has been created. It's called the Hysteria Trust, and it's been set up to raise money to help organisations like these working in this desperately underfunded area. If you'd like to make a donation, then call the numbers on the screen and help care for the living. The numbers will reappear on your screens from time to time, so don't worry if you don't get them straight away. Well, I sincerely hope that none of you will ever get this awful disease. There's no reason, if you're careful, why you should. Uh, I hope that doesn't make you, though, feel callous or self-righteous about those who have. All the performers, producers and helpers who contributed freely to making Hysteria 2 feel very strongly that support should be given to the AIDS charities so that fellow citizens everywhere living with this accursed illness can be helped. I hope you agree. I'm sure you do. You're nice people, awfully nice. How could you not agree? But meanwhile, put on your comedy slippers, plump up your comedy cushions and sit back to enjoy Hysteria 2. Um, send in the next one, please, Mrs. Frittle Papothel Creelfriz. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wildebeest. Theophilus P. Wildebeest. Right. So sing up. <laughs> and uh, how may I help, Mr. Mr. Wildebeest? Well, uh, mind if I sit? Please, help yourself. So I have to get myself in place. <laughs> to jingle my fangs around. Well, are you the main homeboy sex counselor dude in this town? Well, I am a sex counselor, certainly, yes. Well, baby, I can't call you baby, can I? If it gives you pleasure. <laughs> well, baby, the thing is, I need some advice. You see, I've got a big, big drive. I think you know what I'm talking about. I see. Is this um, gravel or tarmac? <laughs> Say what? This drive of yours, is it gravel or is it tarmac? No, 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 I'm, I'm talking about my love drive. Ah, you mean you, you have a powerful libido? Libido bullshit, I got an Eldorado with like a jacuzzi. <laughs> a jacuzzi in the back seat is nice, and a bar and everything. Yes, no, I mean you, you have strong sex urges. Yeah, hey, that's right, baby. Urges, when I urges, I surges. <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. Yes, yes, I'm rather afraid I do. And, um, <laughs> your trouble is that you can't find any partners, is that it? Hey, hey, do you know who you're talking to here? This is the guy who the chicks die for. Ah, you're some sort of poultry farmer, isn't it? <laughs> That's an asshole, I can get it whenever I want it, all right? I just feel that deep within my heart, within my soul, deep down within the core of my being, within my chi, that I need to be more careful, you dig? Ah, you're interested in, in safer sex. Hey, now you're locking it to the socket. Now you're right in the groove, brother. Good, good. Uh, you're, you're interested in ways of practicing. Hey, lover, I don't need no practice, all right? Fine, fine. I'm sorry. Um, I just need to find the right way to take care of my ass and shit. You want to take care of your ass and shit? Right on. I see. 
I need to be a responsible citizen. You know what I'm talking about? Well, about one word in 20 seems to be making sense, yes. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> I like you, baby. I like your white ass. Thank you. It is, uh, it is rather stylish, isn't it? Yes. Um... Right. Well, the most simple, straightforward and effective way of, practice, of performing straight sex uh -huh. is to uh, wear a condom. Condom? <laughs> yes. Oh, a condom! That's right. That's yeah, well, the thing is, baby, I've seen these condoms, right? And the thing is, the truth of the matter is, see, I'm not the kind of guy to beat about the bush. You know what I'm talking about? I hope I don't. The thing is, they're too small. They're too small? <laughs> they're too small! I can barely get them over my ears. <laughs> yes, um... <laughs> the, 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 the basic, <laughs> basic principle behind them, Mr. Wild the Beast, is, is, to, is to put them on your, uh, as you would say, your, your dick. I'm a dick? Yes. Oh, wow! I'm a dick. Yes. What happens then? Uh, well, then you and your partner are protected from infection. How's that? Uh, well, it, 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 the condom will collect your, your seminal fluid, you see. All right. Ain't no stopping this now. Woo! Give me five. Uh, right, five condoms. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what size? Hey, you have to ask. No, of course not. I'm sorry. Five condoms, small. There you are. All right. And uh, let me have a bottle of that seminal fluid, too. This is an exciting time uh, to be uh, performing, isn't it? Because I'm very excited about deciding which of the ten water and sewage businesses of England and Wales to put my money into. And I I'd like to join in on the theme that some other performers have been developing on the environment. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the environment myself. After all, I, I live there. And I'm very, I'm very pleased that uh, a lot of people have turned... Even Margaret Thatcher has turned green, hasn't she? Uh, probably as a result of swimming in the North Sea. It's... Uh, it turns out there are more chemicals in the North Sea than in a sample of Ben Johnson's urine. So I'm... You know, a lot of, a lot of um, resorts around the country, uh, around the country, British Isles, you can't uh, go for a swim anymore, not really. All you can do is to get in the water and, and go through the motions. But it's... Um, it's a... There's all these dreadful things like um, oil disasters, which seem to go on the, the whole time. Uh, nothing quite as bad yet here as that dreadful one of the Exxon disaster in Alaska. Uh, but uh, I, I've got a friend in the oil, he's in oil in a small way, in fact he's a sardine, and uh, he... No, no he's not, obviously, no, obviously he's not, obviously he's not, he's uh... no, that's a silly joke, sorry, sorry. No, he's, a, he's a pilchard. Anyway, apparently, according to him, um, the, the SO companies, it used to be called, changed their name to Exxon some time ago, because the word SO was a rude word in Japanese or something like that, uh, but unfortunately now Exxon is a, is a rude word in Alaska, um, the Eskimos in Alaska apparently have got 14 different words for snow, uh, and now they've got uh, uh, 27 words for oil slick. And they all be begin with F. And uh, they end in King Exxon. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, here is uh, Harry Enfield with Craig Ferguson. That Clive Anderson's a wanker, isn't he? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> you can't beat a good pub, eh? You can't beat a really good pub. That's certainly true. If you want a bloody awful night out, you can't beat a good pub. <laughs> what are you on about, eh? If you hate pubs so much, how come you're in here every night? Well, I come in here to meet people, don't I? Well, go on, then. What? Meet someone. I already have. Who? You. I meet you here every night. Why don't you just admit it? What? You come here to meet women. You just don't have the guts. That's the difference between us, you see. I've got the guts. I just can't be bothered. I'm cool. <laughs> You're just plain pathetic. Oh, yeah? Yeah. All right, then. Watch this. What's this? You'll see. There you go. Nobby, buy the gents dog and duck. That's me, right? Right. Now, watch this.
How about that, eh? Oh, very nice, yeah. You threw a packet of cigarettes out the door. Exactly. Now all I've got to do is wait. For what? For the sexy ladies to walk down the street, see the fags, pick them up, read them, write them, bring them in here to me. That's the way to meet women. Make them come to you. I'm smooth, you see. That's the difference between us. You're bloody barking mad. That's the difference between us. What woman in her right mind's going to pick your cigarettes off the street? Princess Lady Di, Angela Lansbury, Jerry Hall. <laughs> Jerry Hall? What the hell is Jerry Hall going to be doing in Peckham? Same as me. Looking for action. <laughs> I don't know. Nothing on telly, mix on tour, ops on the bus to Peckham, don't she? <laughs> Walking past the pub, goes down to tie up her shoelaces, clocks the fags. Wallop! It's Jerry's lucky night! <laughs> All right, Mr. Smoothie. Let's say Jerry walks in here, hands you the fags. What are you going to say to her? Something smooth, like, Hello, darling, what's a lovely bird like you doing with a name like Jeremy? <laughs> Get your laughing gear around that! She's from Texas, you prat. They don't have laughing gear in Texas. Well, Mick has, hasn't he? M Mick has, yes. <laughs> he could get his laughing gear around Texas, in fact, didn't <laughs> he? See what happens when you start ad libbing, Nobby? Yeah, well, yes, I get the biggest laugh, yeah, don't get I? Up with it, you <laughs> no. no, Nobby. Nobby, do me a favour. Please. What? When a woman walks in, leave her talking to me. I know how to talk to women. I understand them. I know what they're after. Oh, yeah? What's that, then? Mystery. A man of mystery. Jerry Hall walks in here. I look at her, she looks at me. I don't say a thing. I let my face do the talking. And my hand as well, sometimes, as well. <laughs> See, what does that remind you of? A whale on acid. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see who you prefer. You're too right, mate. I'm ready. So am I. I'm hot. Hot but cool. I've got my motor running, don't you worry, pal. Don't look like she's coming, does no, it? No, no, shame that. Should we go for a curry, then? Why not? All right. Can't hang about. Too busy. But let's face it, if she had come in, she'd have gone for the mystery man. <sighs> no, mate, the smoothie. Oh, mystery man. The smoothie. Mystery man. Smoothie. Mystery man. Smoothie. Mystery man. Smoothie. Excuse me, gentlemen. <laughs> Is one of y'all knobby? No. <laughs> Shoot, I thought it was my lucky night. Bye now. Well, thank you, comrades, for that grudging ripple. Um, it's delightful to be here, if only really to poke a finger in the... Is this on, this microphone? Can you hear me? Oh, I was just checking. It's not a rhetorical question, by the way. Do feel free. So you might think that was rhetorical. Good question. Can we hear him? Good point. Discuss. No. Um, and what do we mean by here? What I was going to say is nice to be here to poke a finger in the eye of those who believe that AIDS is God's punishment, because there are those who believe that AIDS was sent by God to punish people for being homosexual. In that case, what was the plague for? Punish people for wearing period costume? <laughs> well, my dear old loves, what's been happening since we last spoke? There's been a water shortage. There's a hose pipe ban all over the place. I don't know what George Michael's going to put down his trouser legs from now on. <laughs> and there's a food crisis, of course, with problems with listeria and so forth. But I'm quite careful about food, but I refuse to accept the possibility of listeria in Marks and Spence's food hall. I'm sorry, Marks and Spencer's Food Hall is one of the few remaining civilised institutions in this country. 
finding out that their food's got bacteria is like finding out their underwear's all got crabs. <laughs> of course, the government's answer to the food crisis is to blame us, the public, for our unhygienic kitchen practices, because you know what we're like, the public. We go in the kitchen and we rub some raw meat into an open wound and then <laughs> blow our nose on the oven mitt and have a shit in the wok because we're the public. <laughs> It's in our nature. And the Greens say it's our fault. The Greens don't help. They say, look what we've all done, man. Look what we've all done to our planet, man. Humans. Look what... Do you mean we? We? I might have had the odd squirt under an arm, but I'm not exactly the Runcorn chemical plant. <laughs> and now the Royals are in on it. Queen's decided all the Royal cars must have lead-free petrol. As soon as she found out, you have to put petrol in cars. She'll be pissed off when she finds out the chauffeur's been nicking all the free glasses, won't she? Because <laughs> normally they don't get involved, the royals. They're apolitical, which means you want other people to be right-wing on your behalf. I mean, well, Charles and Di made a stand on China. They didn't go to China because Philip told them they'd come back slitty-eyed. <laughs> but they don't normally get involved, you see, because they're supposed to be beyond and above politics. People say the Queen has no real power. Well, she's got a sight more than us. I mean, after an election... <laughs> after an election, the Queen invites somebody to form a government. Now, she's got no say in who and who it is, but you'd think in Thatcher's case she'd have tried to stall her for as long as possible, wouldn't you? <laughs> Steer the conversation onto something else. <laughs> Show her around the garden, it's huge. <laughs> Slides, holiday snaps, anything. Show around the palace. This is where we were thinking of knocking through. <laughs> Into South London. Because <laughs> if Arthur Scargill was elected, she'd be shouting through the letterbox at the palace, going, they're not here, they've moved. <laughs> I don't know where they are, we're just squatters. <laughs> Which, in a sense, is true, of course. But the whole thing about the environment thing, it's simply a matter of keeping costs down. Like with farming, dairy cattle are shot full of this hormone called bovine somatropin. So now mums can say to their children, drink your milk and you'll grow up big and strong. Within two or three days. <laughs> you'll be as strong as an ox. You'll probably look like one. And this scary cow's brain disease. Cows have all got this thing, and their brains are being put in sausages, and their, cow, their cows have got bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which rots cows' brains. But the trouble is with cows, how do you tell? <laughs> because they're not the most intellectual of creatures in the first place. You're going to set them tests, geography O level what? I mean, what questions do you ask a brain diseased cow? Can I have my job back, Margaret? Thank you. Cheers.
All of us need friends, even if it's just someone to listen. If we're ill, we may need someone to help with the little things we can usually do for ourselves. The shopping, the washing, maybe even getting out of the house for a walk. But what if there's nobody? I mean, being alone is hard enough for a healthy person. For someone with AIDS, it can be deadly. If you're sick, who goes to the shops? If you find it hard to walk, how do you get out? Who drives the car, pushes the wheelchair? When you need to talk, who's listening? Well, there are people, and they're called buddies. At the moment, the Terence Higgins Trust Buddy Programme has 250 specially trained volunteers. Each person with AIDS who asks for help is assigned their own buddy, someone always ready to help, to talk or lend a sympathetic ear. AIDS is everyone's problem, gay, straight, male, female. And whatever we do, at least 12,000 British people will be living with AIDS by 1992. Many will need buddies. All buddies are volunteers, but money's desperately needed to pay for their training, travel and telephones. Support the Buddies programme and help care for the living. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hugh Laurie has kindly consented to embarrass us all with a song entirely of his own composing, entitled, quite simply, Mystery. Mr. Hugh Laurie, Mystery. Thank you. Mystery. All my life has been a mystery. You and I were never ever meant to be That's why I call my love for you a mystery Different country You and I have always lived in a different country And I know that airline tickets don't grow on a tree so what kept us apart is plain for me to see That much at least is not really a mystery <laughs> Estuary I live in a houseboat on an estuary Which is handy for my work with the Thames Water Authority But I know you would have found it Insanitary Insanitary Taking a violent dislike to me I'd be foolish to ignore the possibility That if we'd ever actually met You might have really hated me But still that's not the only problem That I can see Dead since 1973 <laughs> You've been dead now Wait a minute, let me see Sixteen years come next January As a human being, you are history So why do I still long for you? Why is my love so strong for you? Why did I write this song for you? Well, I guess it's just a mystery. It's just a mystery. Mystery! having me here tonight. I think it's sort of important that I'm here because you can really tell where your career stands by which benefit you're invited to. 
true. Like this one is very, very good, right? But if you're invited to do the Save the Bavarian Beaver, I'd say your career's on the skids. <laughs> I couldn't get into Amnesty. I auditioned. I sang, I tapped, I went to the stage door, I screamed, I have a Puerto Rican cleaning woman, I know what suffering is. <laughs> I couldn't even get to the Mandela concert, couldn't even get in. Mandela, Mandela, how many times have I said Nelson Mandela in my life? Once, suddenly I'm buying the t-shirt. Isn't that the highest homage you can pay to somebody in the 80s, the t-shirt, right? A Nobel Peace Prize, forget it. An Oscar, take a hike, but your face on a t-shirt, it's like the Turin Shroud with sleeves. <laughs> I saw Richard, if he didn't have tight buns, he'd never get on the screen gear. He sang happy birthday to Nelson. I bet that scared the South African government shitless. <laughs> you know the one I want to get in on next, the next benefit, I want to do the greens, right? I know that's gonna be a big career launcher. If anybody's out there, I'm available. I think the only thing that's gonna let me down is my attitude. Everybody is doing everything they can. Sting is at this moment gluing back bark on every tree south of the equator. <laughs> Joan Collins is plucking the placenta out of her moisturizer and returning it to its owners. And George Michael, God bless his heart, is thinking up a song and desperately trying to find something that rhymes with ozone. No, I, you know, it's not, I, I feel as bad as the next person. You know, I feel bad when some polar bear has his ghoulies torn off to make, be made into earmuffs. But I said it before, I will say it again. You show me a vegan and I will show you a face full of zits. <laughs> What's this natural? Everything has to be natural. I spent hours scraping natural off of my shoe. I don't want to eat it for lunch. <laughs> Everybody's eating tofu, new, tofu, tofu. We gotta have tofu, girls. Have you ever had a yeast infection? It's not 200 miles from what tofu looks like. <laughs> Did you ever think maybe an animal would like to be a coat? You know, there may be some mink somewhere, he's depressed. <laughs> he's depressed, he's got nothing to live for. What does he do, he pees on leaves, he gets mounted twice a day. Maybe he'd like to get on the back of some bimbo and go to the Ritz for tea, how do I know? <laughs> I'd now like to introduce a couple of bitches. I can't really tell them apart. I know one of them's blonde, so I gotta flip them over to see which one's which. I know you've seen the act, so uh, they do it at all benefits. Please welcome the godheads of comedy, Dawn and the one who bleaches her hair. Thank you. for that lovely disco dancing to the tune of When Will I Be Famous by the band Brothers, <laughs> which was very suitable for my theme for assembly this week, which is achievement. I don't know how many of you saw the lovely David Attenborough documentary on television last night. <laughs> But on it, there was another item which illustrates my sub-theme for assembly this week, which is, if at first you don't succeed, try, try. Right, try you. <laughs> yes, you, Mary Gordon, you know who you are. <laughs> See me after. <laughs> In the documentary, girls, there was a tiny butterfly inside a cocoon. In order to escape from the cocoon to freedom, the butterfly had to nibble a little hole and push its head through. <laughs> After much perseverance and struggle, the butterfly did indeed push its head through to freedom. And the moral of this story is, girls, if your holes are too small, just keep on pushing and everything... <laughs> right, you. 
<laughs> yes, you ugly girl there, 2C. Don't look at your friends, I'm talking to you. Stand up. Right, I'm glad you've stood up. Can you see something about that girl, Miss Barnes? Yes, she is wearing tan tights. <laughs> there is a rule in this school. Nobody below fifth form is allowed to wear tan tights. And there is a reason for that rule. Except I for staff, isn't it? Except for yes. staff, Miss Barnes. <laughs> I will not have staff, are, staff allowed are allowed to, to wear tan tights. Yes. I will but not not tracksuits. No. I will Except not PE the department. PE department are allowed to wear tracksuits. Right, sit down, I'll see you afterwards. Is there anything else before I go on? I have in my hand here a detention list. And it appears to me that this list gets longer every day. <laughs> These girls will stay behind after school. Fiona Cotter Craig, jewellery. Pauline Wilde, pregnant again, Pauline, are you? <laughs> Joe Laurie, Alice Faye, Felicity O'Brien, sitting on the radiators. Uh, I will not have that selfish sort of behaviour from girls in this school. We do not spend nearly a hundred pounds a year on school heating to warm your nasty little bottoms, do we? No, we don't. I do not come round your houses and sit on your radiators, do I? Yes, you do. No, Pat, I don't, do Miss Barnes. <laughs> Is there anything else before we go on? No, yeah. you! Yes, you at the back, Grey Perm, Geography, Mrs Griffiths, is it? Shut up, woman! I, I just wanted to no, say... No, you the... shut up as well now, Miss right. Barnes. Hands on head. <laughs> there has been a lowering of standards in this school. An increase in shameful and shoddy behaviour. <laughs> Just the other night, whilst I was cruising around town on my way home from school, not only did I see three manor school girls not wearing regulation berries, you know who you are, but as I was passing the bus terminus, I saw four girls entwined around male creatures. I was one of those. I <laughs> will not have that evil, sordid, carnal, lascivious sort of behaviour. It belongs in the sewer. I do not know what goes on in the horrible stench-filled little hovels that you all call home, <laughs> but I will not have it whilst you are in school uniform. If you think I am being unfair, if you think I am wrong, then you can come and see me in my office. We can have a friendly chat about it, all right? <laughs> I am an approachable person. That is my job. <sighs> Who laughed? Not me. No. Right, I will see every girl in this school in my office after assembly. I want to see you down on your knees, begging me for forgiveness. I'm going to whip down your panties and spank some sense head, into those... Head, head, can I volunteer for that punishment, please? <laughs> Not again, Miss Barnes. <laughs> right, any girls interested in cricket will uh, see me on the playing fields after school. Thank you. Carry on, Miss Barnes. School file out. <laughs> East Edinburgh. There are a thousand people who are HIV positive in this city. In this grey pre-war housing estate, the Aberlour Child Care Trust has for the past year been running a remarkable project. I'm Muriel Gray and this is Brenda House. It's named after a young Glasgow woman, herself a drug addict, who was concerned about the number of women unable to seek help for fear of having their children taken away from them. This block of flats was set aside to help those women. <laughs> In here, they're also facing a new challenge, AIDS. Isabel Hamilton is project leader here. 
What do you think is the most valuable service that you provide? I think the safe environment for women with their children, without fear of losing their children, initially is the, sa is, is the most valuable service. I think for years women who have been dependent on drugs or alcohol have had the added fear of losing their children and been seen as being unfit mothers. Um, and Brenda House provides somewhere where they can come and keep the care of their children. They see this as most important. A Brenda House isn't an easy option. Everyone who comes here has to stay clean of drugs and alcohol. They have to work hard to make a new life for themselves and their families. And of course, every day they have to face the realities of living on this housing estate. But unless they can make it work, they too will be part of the spread of AIDS. Well, you can help prevent more families from suffering, so help us care for the living. The next um, visiting guest artiste that I want to present to you is of such international standing that I feel that I personally am not equipped with the vocal and dramatic skills uh, that would enable me to introduce this guest east efficiently enough. <laughs> efficiently enough, as an example of a lack of verbal skills. Um, <laughs> so I've decided that the best and most honest thing to do is to hold an audition from three jobbing actors who've kindly agreed to be here uh, to cast the most successful applicant in the post of announcing the next guest artiste. And if we can have our first auditioner, please, whose name is Mr. Josh Auckland. Can we have Mr. Auckland, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Splendid. The name is Ackland. Of course it is. Ackland. Yes. Mr. Ackland. Yes. All right, Josh. So, have you brought your card along for you to read from? My Just card? Yes. A little card, a little yellow card, to read mm. the speech. That small piece yes, of that's influence. Right. Yes, yes. that's right. Now, there I'd just like to read that speech. This is the speech to announce our next guest, but we've, we've given our next guest a kind of code name so we don't give away the surprise. All right, so we'd just like to read. Certainly. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, very exciting news now for the Sadler's Wells Theatre. The Hysteria Group and myself personally, as I introduce a man who is not just there for the nasty things in life, but for the good things too. The one, the only, Leslie Thigh Pressure. Mm. Do you, um... <clears throat> Do you, do you actually have an equity card, Mr. Auckland? I do, and the name is Ackland. Do you, can I see it, please? Certainly. Thank you. Excellent. There we go. If you'd just like to, um, just like to wait in the corner, we have a couple of others to see. Yep. Thank you very much. Our next... you ring my agent about this? Yes, of course. All right. Our next... Um... <laughs> Our next auditioner is called Mr. Edward Answer. If we can have Mr. Answer, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Very good. All right, uh, all right then, Mr. Answer. That, that should be Asner. Asner. Yes, I, I'm sure it should, but you better take that up with your parents, not with me. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever ever done anything like this before? Uh, uh, not, uh, not exactly, no. no, not exactly, isn't it? I love this one already. It's sweet. It's sweet. I like it. All right, then. All right. Are you, are you ready to, to read something from your card? Uh, right. I'll give up my best shot. Well, I'd rather you just read it, if you don't mind. <laughs> All right. Off you go. Um, ladies and gentlemen, very exciting news now oh, excuse for me. the... Have you, have you got a misprint on yours? It should say very exciting news. Have you... Uh... Very exciting news. That's what it says. Yes, I, I wasn't told that this one had a speech impediment. <laughs> is it... What? Oh, is he? Is he? Um, I understand you're American. Is that right? <laughs> you bet. No, no. I, Stephen, bet couldn't be here. You remember? <laughs> All right. Now, um, I'm... Uh... 
I'm very sorry you, you had to leave your own country and try and look for work here. Um, <laughs> if you'd uh, just like to go and join Mr. Auckland, he'll help you with your vowel trouble, all right? Uh, I do... Uh... I, I do impersonations, too. Yes, well, perhaps you could do an impersonation of somebody going over there and talking to Mr. Walker. <laughs> we do have someone else to see. Thank you. Um, uh, and our final jobbing actor calls himself Mr. Paul Teddington. If you'd like to come here, Mr. Teddington, thank you very much. All right. All right. OK. Have you, have you ever done anything like this before? No. Not really. Not really. <laughs> oh. Bless him. Bless him. Have you got your card? Okay. Have you got your little card? If you'd just like to, like, like to have a read. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, very exciting news yes. now. Whoops. 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 <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, just got one word to offer you here, Paul. Just one word. C can, can you guess what it is? Um, no, it's not um. um <laughs> Nice to have a guest, though. Well done. It's authority. Oh. Authority. Authority. Yes. Have you ever um, looked back on your long and interesting career in our seaside rep theatres and um, imagine? <laughs> have you ever have you ever played a figure of authority, a, a politician, a, a, something like that? Uh, yes. You yes, have. Yes. What sort of figure have you played? Prime Minister. You've played a Prime Minister. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry I didn't get to see it. I very rarely get to get to Westcliff on Sea, but I'm sure it was a, <laughs> a gorgeous performance. So, why not read it now, giving it all the authority you give your character? Ladies, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, very exciting news now for the Sadler's Wells Theatre, the Hysteria Group, and myself. Personally, as we... Int uh, myself personally. <laughs> as, as we introduce... Is that right? Yes. Introduce the one, the only, Leslie Thigh Trembler. Thigh Pressure. Yes. Leslie Thigh Pressure. Um, are you open to, to constructive criticism? Yes, valuable? Of yes. Um, forget it. Paul. <laughs> Bless you, forget it. If we're going to have our other two forget. back, I, I'm afraid I found it very hard to choose between them. I'm going to ask them all, please, to introduce our guest artiste. This time they can use, of course, the real name, uh, which is written on their cards. So if you'd like to read out now, please, and introduce our special artist. Ladies and gentlemen, very exciting news now for the Sadler's Wells Theatre, the Hysteria Group, and myself personally, as we introduce the one, the only, Leslie Fire Pressure. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our church. <laughs> Would it were a happier occasion, for we are gathered here today to pay our last respects to Thomas Fairclough, Richard Mason, and Harold Walker. Tom, Dick, <laughs> and Harry, as they were known to all of us, three stout fellows of our village who will be sorely missed. Tom, sadly, was blind, an affliction he bore with great fortitude, especially considering he was also deaf. His only power was that of speech and song, and we all recall his enormous voice joining lustily in our hymn singing. Of course, being blind and deaf, Tom never actually knew what hymn we were singing. <laughs> which seemed appropriate, because we never knew what hymn he was singing either. In fact, if we had to be frank with each other, Tom didn't actually know any hymns. <laughs> Thus it is with deep gratitude we recall the day when Colonel Grant, using only a sense of touch through the medium of a clenched fist, <laughs> actually broke through to Tom and got him to shut up. <laughs> Needing guidance through the darkness of life, Tom was lucky to have a friend like Dick. Dick had perfect eyesight and would gladly lead Tom wherever he wanted to go. 
Unfortunately, since Dick was deaf, he couldn't actually hear where Tom wanted to go. <laughs> Yet, like Tom, Dick never complained about his afflictions, could he? Did he? Well, he couldn't. <laughs> he was dumb. <laughs> but blessed with the gift of vision, though stone deaf, he was a tremendous fan of Bananarama. <laughs> Being such an idiosyncratic pair, deaf to the world about them, Tom and Dick were to have the permanent companionship of Harry. Harry could literally hear a pin drop. Although, being blind and dumb, he could not see to pick it up. Or ask anyone else not to stand on it. And so, as individuals, they were sadly afflicted. But together, they were in possession of all of God's senses, weren't they? And it is together <laughs> that we remember them. Together at their job, checking eggs at the battery farm. <laughs> Dick would look for the cracks, Tom would complain to the foreman, and Harry would do the listening to Radio One. Likewise, in the evening, when they had returned from work, they would all sit on the big couch in front of the television. Dick watching it, Harry listening to it, and Tom remarking that rubbish like this just wasn't worth the license fee. <laughs> Sadly, as we all know, three days ago, their peaceful lives were ended. Dick saw the combine harvester. Harry heard the combine harvester, but neither could cry out. Tom, who could have cried out, never had the faintest idea what hit him. <laughs> and so they were all harvested together, blended into oneness at last, and now we trust are in heaven, as happy as any in that immortal host. For Dick will see the angels' choir Harry will hear the angels' choir, and no doubt Tom will ruin it for everybody. <laughs>
Please give a very, very big hand for Tony Slattery and Richard Branch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Richard and I were lucky enough to see Douglas Bader dance. <laughs> he, he was dancing the pas de deux from L'Après-Midi d'Amphone 
partnered by Jesse Norman. It was a sensitive, if somewhat noisy, performance. And so as our tribute to the richly tapestried world of classical ballet, a vast panorama of human talent peopled by such people as Rudolf Nureyev, to name but a few. And so we now recreate for you that historic moment. I was introduced. <laughs> I was introduced to the performing arts at an early age. I was born during a concert of classical music, a cello recital, in fact. In fact, my mother was the soloist at the time. <laughs> it's all coming back to me now. It was Paris. I'm still haunted by the haunting strains of that haunting melody by Ravel. I didn't have a happy youth. I had one or two miserable ones. <laughs> I remember my father was also in show business. He was an entertainments officer for the Bader Meinhof gang. <laughs> I remember he used to regale me with theatrical anecdotes as he bounced me up and down on his lap shortly before his arrest. But I was hooked. And soon, I began to travel the world as an internationally renowned mime artiste with my special physical skills. India. <laughs> Egypt. <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> Japan. <laughs> Belgium. <laughs> and then, onto a whistle-stop tour of no less than 8,000 really big American cities. And the press boys loved us. Boston. <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> and then back to Paris. <laughs> to resume my studies of the classics the Russian dramatist Anton Chekhov. The moon shines bright tonight. I must go to Moscow. Don't you understand me? Constantine's dead. <laughs> and then, of course, I went on <laughs> to study the English dramatist Harold Pinter. Kettle's boiling. <laughs> I've trodden on your cornflake again. <laughs> Having conquered the theatre, I moved into the world of film. First brief encounter. That's my train. No chance of a fuck, then. <laughs> Hello, legal Hello, line. legal line. As a lawyer, I'm used to seeing people judged. But those judgments took place in court after a criminal trial. Here, in the AIDS Helpline Office, volunteers deal with inquiries from people who every day are being judged and sentenced simply because they're HIV positive. Last year, hundreds of people were judged as dangerous by their employers and sentenced to unemployment. People judged as unsuitable tenants by their landlords and sentenced to homelessness.
Take Robert. He'd lost his job and was being abused by his neighbours and getting voodoo dolls, excrement and urine through his letterbox. The people here knew exactly what to do. They lobbied his town hall and arranged a priority transfer to a new flat. They helped him fight and win an unfair dismissal case which resulted in compensation. But winning such cases costs money. We need more phones, more helpers, more lawyers. And there will be more people who need these services each year. New drugs are helping people with AIDS to live longer. By 1992, there'll be more people who need assistance, over 12,000 of them. Support these services. Pick up your phone now. You can help us to care for the living. Fucking embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> have you, ever, have you, have you, um, have, 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 have you ever done that? Have you ever, you ever worked your bollocks off trying to, um, no, no, trying to put on a, a small light family entertainment and then found the two artists that you thought were friends decided it would be amusing to get pissed um, instead of going on and doing a carefully rehearsed sketch. Uh, that ha that's, it's happening to me all the time. Uh, it's, uh, it's very embarrassing. However, uh, perhaps um, <coughs> just as some kind of recompense to my two dearest ex-friends who are about to come on. Um, as the curtain rises, perhaps we could just rehearse this. As the curtain rises, just the word bollocks shouted quite, <laughs> quite firmly. Can I just rehearse you in this? Three, two, one. Bollocks! <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. I think that might uh, surprise them into something. Uh, meanwhile, you can imagine there's a scene of serenity and peace backstage. Um, trickles of blood are about to appear just down each side. Little thumping noises and so on. Uh, I see one of my friends now on, uh, on the right-hand stage, the other one left. I think we may be quite soon ready to go. Is that correct? No, no. Shaking hands and so forth. Um, so, a little about the genesis of the sketch you're about to see. <clears throat> it's called, quite simply, Who Killed Maureen? Uh, and is set on one of the South Sea Islands in 1926. Um, the story concerns a colonial governor called Augusta and her husband, Jane. Um, we begin the sketch on a summer's afternoon with the colonial governor reading the Times. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Dot to the power of 25. I've, I've, have you ever pondered, as I have many times, on the similarity of a pelican and British gas? They can both stick their bills up their arses. <laughs> um, it's, uh, hmm? Incidentally, incidentally, bloody ghastly, isn't it? This BG. What is that about? What a beautiful globe, you know, this sort of pathetic way. Advertisers have suddenly seen there's a green bandwagon and they've chased after it. British gas stands for beautiful globe. Um, if anyone would like to leave behind a slip of paper on which the initials BG better express British gas, I should be very, very grateful. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you if you'd ever done is have you ever appeared on stage to fill in rather quietly for some friends and then suddenly had this extraordinary desire to urinate. <laughs> so, again, that's something else always happening to me. Um, 24th of August 1957 saw a very exciting moment for my mother. It was my birth. Um, moving swiftly on through kindergarten, prep school, um, summary dismissals and expulsions. Um, I arrived at man's estate at the age of, I suppose, about 18 or 19, like most of us did. And I said to myself, this globe, this earth, 
What is it here for? Who put it there? What is, what is God really about? Some people, when speaking about AIDS, have said that AIDS is a punishment from God on aberrant or promiscuous lifestyles. I'd like us to consider what kind of God could look down on an earth which daily rehearses millions of acts of brutal, pitiless cruelty, torture and horror and ignores them and instead visits the foulest plague ever to have been given to humankind on those whose only sin is to slip between the sheets with those they like. What kind of God would do that? No kind of God. AIDS, AIDS is not a judgment on its victims. It's a judgment on those who pass by on the other side. Well, we are now ready, I think, for some more action. So uh, thank you for this frank talk. I've enjoyed it very much. <laughs> and uh, I've rather fallen in love with you and decided perhaps to give up my celibacy because there are one or two people here <laughs> I'd rather like to go to bed with. So see you all later in my dressing room. Goodbye. Come. <coughs> Bell. Bell, good to see you. Sorry I was late. The traffic was a bitch. <clears throat> good to see you. Well, the play's going well, isn't it? Looks like we've got a bit of a smash on our hands. Well, it uh, seems to be OK, yeah. Well, they always seem to go for the ones with the snappy titles. Hamlet. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Act three may be a bit long, I don't know. Act three may be a bit long. In fact, generally, I think we've got a bit of a length problem. Uh oh? It's five hours, Bill. <laughs> On wooden seats. And no toilets this side of the Thames. Yeah, well, I've always said the Rose Theatre is a dump, frankly. I mean, the sooner they knock it down and build something decent, the better. <laughs> Exactly. So that's why I think we should trim some of the dead wood. Dead wood? Yeah, you know, some of that stand-up stuff in, in the middle of the action. You mean the soliloquies? Yeah. And I think we both know which is the dodgy one. <laughs> oh, oh, which is the dodgy one? Um, to be nobler in the mind, mortal coil, that one. It's boring, Bill. <laughs> the crowd hates it. Yawnsville. Well, that one, that one happens to be my favourite, actually. Bill, you said that about the avocado monologue in King Lear. <laughs> and the tap dance at the end of Othello. Absolutely not. You cut one word of that and I'm off the play. Bill, Bill, the king has got his costume changed down to one minute. Hamlet's out there ranting on about God knows what in that soliloquy of yours and Claudius is already in the wings waiting to come on with that very funny codpiece. Waiting. <laughs> all right, then you cut the speech altogether. Bill, Bill, Bill. Why do we have to fight? It's long, long, long. We can make it so snappy. Snappy? Yeah, you know, give it some pizzazz. How to, how to begin that, that, that speech? To be. <clears throat> come on, come on, Bill. To be a victim of all life's earthly woes, or not to be a coward and take death by his proffered hand. There, now, I'm sure we can get that down. <laughs> Ab uh, no, absolutely not. It's perfect. How about to be a victim or not to be a coward? It, it doesn't make sense, does it? To be, to be a victim of what? To be a coward about what? OK, OK, take out victim, take out coward. Just start, to be or not to be. You, you, you can't say that, it's gibberish. <laughs> but, it's, but, it's, but it's short, William, it's short, listen, it flows. To be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> You're damn right it's the question, don't you have any bloody idea what he's talking about? Well, OK, let's leave that and go on. Blah, 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 blah. Slings and arrows, good. Action, the crowds love it. Take up arms, brilliant, against those cursed doubts that do plague on man. Mm, getting very woolly there, Bill. Plague's a bit tasteless at the moment. We've had letters, actually. 
and set sail on a sea of troubles. This is good. Travel. Travel's very popular. So let's just take out the guff and see what we've got. To suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take up arms against the sea of troubles. Good. I resign. Bill, it's brilliant. It's absolute crap. What is he talking about? He, he, he's going to put on a bow and arrow and potter down to the seaside? This, this is Prince Hamlet, not King Canute. <laughs> Might as well kill himself if that's the best idea he can come up with. Creative thinking, Bill. Hamlet, sh perhaps, perhaps he should top himself. In Act One? <laughs> well, yeah, well, look, we must think about bums on seats, Bill. Let's face it, it's the ghost that's selling this show at the moment. <laughs> Joe Public loves the ghost. He loves the sword fights. He loves the crazy chick in the see-through dress who does the flower gags and then drowns herself. <laughs> but no one likes Hamlet. No one. Well, all right, then I'll kill him off for you. Um, <clears throat> aye, there's the rub. To die, to sleep. Whoops! Hamlet falls off the battlements. Bill, 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 I can see, I can see you're annoyed. I'm sorry. Hamlet, Hamlet has his moments. The mad stuff is very funny. It really is hysterical. But, but, but all I'm saying, Shaky, is that <laughs> we just, let's just shorten this one terribly dull speech. And all I'm saying is no, you cut one word and you can take my name off the credits. All right, how do you do? I'll trim this speech, and you can put back in those awful cockney grave diggers. Well, both of them? Yeah. And the skull routine? Yep, the whole sketch. <laughs> All right, then. You've got a deal. And we'll see which one history remembers. Bill, I love you. Temperamental git. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you sing out of tune, <laughs> so long as you're German. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you can hardly croon, so long as you're German. <laughs> so if you haven't got a note in your head, put on a silly accent instead, and people will stop wishing you the day, so long as you're German. Doesn't matter if the notes are all wrong, and people are squirming. Just make the tune up as you go along, pretend you're German. And if your voice sounds like it's coming through a strainer, sing it out of sync like Marlena, and soon you'll be compared to Lottie Lenya, who was German. Have a 
wondered what you have to do to sound like a hun. Just chain smoke from the tender age of two. That's how it's done. And when the audience is all walking out, just make believe that you're a quote. Then open your mouth and shout in German. In German. In German. Auf Deutsch! Jawohl! Good evening. Um, my name's Adrian Edmondson. I don't know whether you remember me. <laughs> I used to be very funny. <laughs> but it's been a long time since the young ones. And uh, I've just come to this benefit to uh, boost my sadly flagging career. <laughs> I don't know what the f hysteria is all about. Um, but I have got one joke left that I'd like to share with you all. Um, well, I've got two jokes. Actually. I've got a little hole in my trousers, but it's not very funny. Um, <laughs> the second one, I hope, is slightly funnier. Um, there are two women sitting in the lounge of their house, and uh, one of them says to the other, she's looking out of the window, she says, oh, bugger me. There comes my husband with a big bunch of flowers. Oh, God, what am I going to do? The other one says, well, what's, what's the problem? You know, it's a big bunch of flowers. It's very romantic, isn't it? She says, romantic? Does it mean I'm going to have to lie on my back all night with my legs wide open? <laughs> and the other one says, haven't you got a vase? <laughs> My name is Julian Clary. There are a lot of things we don't know about AIDS, but what we do know is that many people will need first-rate, sympathetic, qualified medical help for long periods of time, which is what they provide here at the Mild May Hospice in Hackney. But this isn't a place where people come to die. As they say here, the accent is on living. Hi, Sarah, I just brought the phone in for you. You have to ring your friend there. Just pop it in. Well, the main emphasis we have here at the Mild May is that um, the patient has control. We don't have any set routines. No one wakes you up at 6am for the cup of tea, which is nice. Yes. Um, and we really try and give the control back to the patients. The other thing that's perhaps slightly different about here at Mild May is that we have people at all different stages of having HIV. Some might be quite sick and need some nursing help. Other people may be physically very well, you know, walk in, have a fairly normal life, but just need a break and have some emotional support. They're quite rational about it all, it's not too dramatic. No, no, I, I feel very much that um, we need to be encouraging people to make the most of the time they've got and to have some good times, it's not all doom and gloom. Today the Mild May provides practical support for hundreds of people with AIDS who cannot care for themselves. Everyone has a right to dignity and comfort, even in extreme illness. But it costs. If you want to support the mild May, then pick up your phone now. Help them to care for the living. Jerry Hall, aren't you? Well, yes, I am. I've got a bone to pick with you about Bovril. <laughs> what is it? 
I've been going through one of the mega jars a week for the last 10 years, and look at what it's done for me. I can tell you've got a Bovril body. Well, actually, I've got three. That's the problem. <laughs> I'll stick to the regime religiously. I get up in the morning, two fried eggs, fried slice, beans, chips, a few mushrooms, maybe a few croissants when I'm feeling a bit peckish. But always, always the Bovril. Lunchtime. Oh, you know, maybe a steak and kidney pie, roast potatoes, beans, peas, followed by a big slice of lemon meringue pie, but always religiously, the bovro. At night, well, what could be nicer than to go for a nice ruby money? A nice big chicken vindaloo, or a kerma, or a kima, or a nice bit of lamb. And then, of course, religiously, the bovro. I rest my case. Well, now tell me, what exactly do you do with the bovro? How do you use it? I've got a big mug, mug big yeah. spoon of the bovril, yeah. boiling hot water, skush, 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 stir, 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 drink it. You've been drinking it? <laughs> well, I can't believe it, that's what's wrong. I use it to polish my shoes. <laughs> Stephen Fry is going to do a sketch now by, about safe sex. Pay very close attention, because I hear he's going to do something very subtle with his cervix. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. <clears throat> yes, we've heard already, haven't we, darlings, a great deal about, um, about safe, well, uh, safe sex. Um, and, and there are hundred, hundreds of ways of performing safe um, coition, copulation, uh, sexual intimacy, or congress. There's so many words for it, aren't there? Fucking was one I heard the other day. Um, so uh, we'd like now, uh, with the aid of some demonstrators, to actually show you, I've split an infinitive, I did warn you it would happen, to show you actually what happens uh, when safe sex is performed. So would you welcome now, please, our two demonstrators. They are Mr. Aid Edmondson and Miss Dawn French. And you're going to demonstrate some safe and some unsafe positions for us, is that right? Yes, That's yeah. about the size of it, Stephen. Size isn't important, Aid. I thought you knew that. All right? <laughs> Thank you. All right, could you go straight away, please, into unsafe position <laughs> number one? We'd like to see unsafe position number one. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, that position, ladies and gentlemen, that position is unsafe. That is an unsafe position. And break. Thank you. Thank you very much. And relax. Lovely. Would you now like to show us, please, the safe version of that position? Thank you. <clears throat> position is perfectly safe. And break. And break. Thank you. All right. Now, can we have a look now, please, when you're ready and in your own good time, at unsafe position number two. Unsafe position number two. This position is most awfully unsafe. And break. And break. <coughs> and if you could now show us, please, the safe version of this position. <laughs> A position there that's perfectly safe. And relax. Now, please, may we see unsafe position Number three. Unsafe position number three. <sighs> this position is radically unsafe. May we now have a glimpse at the safe version of this position. <clears throat> this position 
position perfectly safe. A perfectly safe position. Thank you. And now let's have a look at our most dangerous position, please, which is unsafe position number four. This is a very, very unsafe position. If you'd like to assume it, please. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> This position is most awfully unsafe. I'm feeling unsafe. I'm feeling unsafe. Yes, I think you'd better break out of it as quickly as you can, please. <laughs> and now to see the safe version of this position, we need a third demonstrator. So would you welcome, please, Mr. Mel Smith. Thank you. I'm so... I always get them muddled up. I'm Hi, Mel. <laughs> All right. Good luck. All right. And now can we quickly see, please, the safe version of that fourth dangerous position, the safe version. <laughs> there we are. And break. Well, I, I hope we've all picked up something there. I rather hope we haven't. Yes, I hope we haven't picked something up. You're quite right. Thank you to our three demonstrators. Many thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, every now and again, and it's rarely, a star is born. And less often, that star becomes a superstar. Occasionally, once perhaps every three or four hundred years, <laughs> such a superstar becomes a legend. And just once in the lifetime of each galaxy, <laughs> such a legend becomes a myth. <laughs> a rarer journey still is that from myth to amateur cathedral swallower. <laughs> it's my privilege tonight to introduce to you someone who has reached only the level of myth. Myth Tina Turner. I'm sorry, we hadn't met before. Um, <laughs> Miss Turner, may I be the very first to welcome you here this evening? Uh, John, please do call me Tina. Well, I'd rather not, if you don't mind. It's such an awful name. Um, <laughs> I, I, I what wonder, would you prefer? Well, I wonder, perhaps, could I call you Eric? All right. Fine. Eric, I hope you don't mind my asking this, but um, I noticed that you have a, a slightly unusual accent. Are, are you, in fact, black at all? Yes, I am, in fact, black. 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 Black and a woman, too. Her absolutely splendid. <laughs> and uh, that is what you would like to talk about this evening? Well, we can, but actually, I'm here to sing. Fine, fine. Why not? Is that all right? <laughs> Ah, apparently there's an orchestra here. How fortunate. I'm sorry, I, I, I thought we were going to discuss disadvantages and that sort of thing. <laughs> now, look, uh, this is a microphone. If you, uh, if you sing in this end, you see, then the ladies and gentlemen can hear you better. And it's probably better if you face them. Um, lots of teeth and smiles. And, um, well, jolly good luck. Uh, they're absolutely behind you, so don't be nervous. I mean, they're very charitable, these charitable audiences. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and one word of advice while you're singing, if I may suggest, try and move around a bit, you know, preferably um, <laughs> sort of in, in, in the rhythm of the music, if possible, sort of uh, onward, Christian soldiers marching. That's my idea. Just, uh, just an idea. 
Well, actually, John, I, I prefer to do something like... Yes. A word in your ear, Eric. People in this country don't like a show-off, so I'd sort of... <laughs> Keep it, keep it a bit simple, you know? Less is more, that kind of thing. Less. Now, what, what is the name of this sing that you're going to song for us tonight? I'm going to song. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sing. You're going to sing? Steamy Windows. Steamy Park. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please listen with great politeness and patience to, to Steamy Windows as sung by my absolutely best friend, Miss Eric... Turn up.
another song from my most recent album. I hope that you will recognize this one. It's called, I Don't Wanna Lose You. <laughs>
As my old mother used to say, send fucking sensational. Um, I have very little to add, really. We've um, enjoyed ourselves. I hope you have, too. Um, this AIDS business, it, it won't do. We do hope it goes away. In the meantime, we must uh, all put on our best effort hats and uh, try and help charities such as the Terence Higgins Trust, the oldest uh, AIDS charity in Britain. You know, we had a hysteria a year and a half ago, the first one of its kind, and it was produced by somebody called George Kant, who at the time suffered from the disease. And a couple of months ago, he died from it, suffered, you know, uh, fighting the son of a bitch right to the end of the way. And so uh, we take great pleasure, his parents are here this evening, we take great pleasure in dedicating this entire performance to him and to his memory. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, from everybody at Hysteria 2, thank you all very much indeed. Well, well, I do hope you enjoyed yourselves a great deal. It could have been a lot worse, couldn't it? I mean, there was some nice singing, some humorous jokes, um, some clever skits and some amusing comedy moments generally. Um, I would like very much to thank those who've already called in. The donation numbers will be open for a further couple of hours. The advice number is open 24 hours a day. If you'd like to send a donation by post or over the counter, a caption will shortly appear showing the P.O. box number to which cheques and postal orders can be sent. You can obtain details of which banks and building societies are accepting over the counter donations by calling the telephone numbers taking credit card donations or refer to page 456 of Fortel displaying information on how to donate. The National AIDS Helpline is open all year round too, not just 24 hours a day, but 365 days in a year, unless, of course, it's a leap year. On behalf of the Terence Higgins Trust, on behalf of Hysteria 2, and all those involved in performing and producing it, on behalf of decency, kindness, and human faith everywhere, thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. Why not stay and watch Hitchcock's foreign correspondent? It's rather good. I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs>